Yael, welcome to the webinar today, Low Cost, High Value. We're going to talk about planning and implementing a budget-friendly and high-impact project. I want to say thank you to the USDA for their generous funding. Thank you to the University of Vermont. My employer is the National Farmers Union, Michigan State University Extension, the Cornell Cooperative Extension Vegetable Program for all their support in putting this on. And thanks to everyone who's attending today, both our panelists and our participants. How it's gonna go is we're gonna go around the Zoom room and do some introductions, which means if you're in a place where you can turn your camera on, we'd love to see you. If not, we'll just ask that you unmute when it gets to you, we'll probably call on you. After that, we've got a grower, a grower panel where folks are gonna share some lessons that they've learned, problems that they identified and their low cost solutions to solve them. After that, it's time for group discussion and conversation. For me, that always goes better when people participate. I certainly have a lot of questions I can ask Monica, Gordon, Russell, Laura, but it will definitely go better if y'all ask them. I've just got like pretty standard educator-based questions. I might start quizzing them about the produce safety rule, whereas you as a farmer can ask them farm-based questions. And then at the very end, we'll talk a little bit about follow-up and logistics. So for our introductions, we're gonna ask you to share what your name is, your farm name, where you're located, that can be town and state, and then tell us a little bit about why you wanted to join the webinar today. So is there a problem that you're looking to solve or a creative solution that you are looking to share? And this is a, maybe a little unfair, but Hans, we'll start with you. And if you'll just share who you are, where you're located, why you're here today. And then Gordon, to get you ready, we'll pass the mic to you next after Hans goes. All right, thank you, Billy. And it's actually not unfair. I'm a big fan of Billy's, number one. And um, I am, I coordinate a, a statewide and, and also some neighboring states program with uh, farmers uh, called CAPS, which is, stands for Community Accreditation for Produce Safety. And I've been in kind of the market development side of things and post-harvest side of things, but I also was, um, you know, went back, my career has been as a high school teacher and college teacher in agroecology, forestry, molecular biology, that kind of stuff. So uh, it's a little bit of a change, uh, but in, in a good vein, I've worked on a lot of farms. I'm actually starting a little farm right now. So this, this if I were to pick one workshop, this is the one I'd come to, because um, I'm thinking about low cost kind of carts I can build. Um, I've got a little wash pack station started. I've got a contract for $1,600 with the Putney food shelf to crank out some winter greens from uh, March 1st to uh, May, uh, late May. Uh, so I'm getting ready for that. And um, it's a, uh, I'm actually here as a participant as well as the organizer. Billy doesn't know this, but it's true. So I'm going <laughs> to move on from there. Very cool. That sounds very exciting, Hans. Uh, Gordon, you're up next. Hi, my name is Gordon Jenkins. Um, I'm one of the farmers at Ten Mothers Farm, which is in Cedar Grove, North Carolina, in central North Carolina, not far from Chapel Hill in Durham. Um, I'm here because Billy asked me to join as a, a, a participant to share uh, how we've set up our wash pack in a high tunnel. But I'm also here because I'm excited to hear um, from other people about how they set up their watch pack and, and figure out what we can learn from that too. Great, thank you. Laura, we'll pass the mic to you. Well, I'm Laura Brocious. I own a full plate farm. It's in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan, uh, not far from Marquette. And yeah, I'm presenting today, thanks to Billy's invitation, a little bit about our wash, wash pack setup and, and uh, low cost solutions. Thank you. And Monica and Russell. Hi there. Um, uh, my name is Monica Ponce, um, and I'm a worker owner at Love is Love Cooperative Farm here in Mansfield, Georgia. We're about an hour east of Atlanta. Uh, I'm Russell Hondard. Same farm, same location, mm -hmm. same title, <laughs> worker <laughs> owner. Um, and uh, we're here because we've been participating in the scrub grant, uh, getting a wash pack started for a um, 
four acres and growing farm. Great, thank you. So Tiana, you're up next. Your name, your farm name, where you're located and what motivated you to join today? Hi all, I'm Tiana of Starlight Roots Farm here in Keysville, Georgia. Um, I'm a vegetable farmer, I'm using organic practices I'm interested in this course because I'm in the process of building my wash station and really just, um, you know, making my farm more productive and add new things. I just um, kind of, I've been farming for a while, but just kind of started my own operation just this like last year. So really like building it up, you know, right now. So I'm excited to see what I'm going to learn from this course. Good to be here with y'all. Way cool. We're glad you're here. Jeff, I'll pass the mic to you. Hi, I'm Jeff Anthony. Uh, farm is uh, Pinewood Springs Farm in Rockdale County. It's about uh, 40 minutes southeast of Atlanta. And we just uh, had a building put up for our wash pack, but we have not um, built it out. So this actually was a really good time to take this. And we do uh, egg production as well as vegetables and some fruit. Very cool. And I do want to give an extra shout out to Monica and Russell, but also to Rahul, who are closer to you than maybe some other people on this call and have been doing just incredible work around Washpack. So even after today, and I feel like you might have some things to share with us, lessons learned towards the end of this webinar. Brian Chambers, I'll pass the mic over to you. Uh, yeah, my name's Brian. I'm uh, with Croca Expeditions here in Southwest uh, New Hampshire. Um, I'm the farm manager there. Um, I guess I'm here. We got some plans for a um, wash pack probably for next season that we're working on. I'm just, uh, just trying to get various ideas for that. Cool. Glad to have you. Up next, Sarah Brown. You're on my screen. We're going to pass the mic to you. Yeah. Hi, I'm Sarah Brown. Um, I'm down in Tucson, Arizona, and some friends and I are working on starting a cooperative farm. Um, Gordon actually told me about this webinar series, which has been awesome. Um, so we're kind of conceptualizing everything at this point, including a wash pack station. Very cool. I'm not sure when you jumped on, but just so you know, Monica and Russell are also starting, have started a cooperative farm, and I think could share either today or maybe another time, some really good lessons learned. Then Brian, you're the last person on my screen. If you could come off mute. Hey everyone, um, my name is Brian Morgan. I work at Philo Ridge Farm, which is in Charlotte, Vermont. Um, and I manage a four person crew on a two acre veggie farm. Um, we have some plans for potential wash pack probably next year and this is also just the end of my first season managing a crew so I'm just trying to continue to learn pick up um, tips that others have have sort of explored themselves so that's why I'm here. Man good to have you congratulations on getting through successfully your first season you still seem like you've got your wits about you you have a good <laughs> Attitude, not totally. I'm mostly out, here. So. Yes, thank yeah. you. <laughs> Very cool. Glad to have you. Not uh, yeah. dead yet. <laughs> no. So, a quick overview about just what this scrub thing is. This USDA funded project. Scrub stands for sanitizing, cleaning resources for your, it's you, your business, and it's a multi-state team: Georgia, Michigan, New York. Vermont, and now I would say Arizona, New Hampshire, North Carolina. We can add those to the mix today. And we're working with participant farmers who we are doing some teaching, but I'll really say that they are teaching us just as much. And we're in a position to also be offering them stipends for their time. So we're paying them to be subject matter experts. So those are our partner farms. Then we have participants like you folks on the call today who are here to learn, but also to share and then advise our farmers. A couple of highlights are this is a three year project, which is incredible. So we're just about to wrap up year one and we've been developing a bunch of different resources like these workshops, fact sheets, a really exciting one about brushes. Maybe you think you're not excited about brushes and you see this resource, you will be. 
And then also it's supporting a ton of growers. The goal is 375 and we're off to a really good start. And Hans has kind of coined this phrase, this power pack, resources, workshops, and TA, technical assistance to make sure that we're having positive impact with a big focus on that impact. And so we're looking to actually put plans into place. So I personally have gone to a ton of workshops over the years, thought it was pretty good. Sometimes I thought they were pretty bad. And then I would go back to the farm and not do anything. And so the really big thing about these workshops is that we want to put plans into place. We want folks to feel confident enough to implement changes. One of my farmer heroes, Sarah Cook Fair at Big Branch Valley the other day was just telling me that the value of this project is that she has a million different things she could do every single day on the farm to improve it. And it's almost paralyzing. So using these workshops to identify a few key things that you can do. The strategy is to meet y'all where you're at. So doing one-on-one -on -one technical assistance because some folks like Jeff have laid some concrete. Some folks like Monica and Russell are waiting on the concrete and some people like Gordon chose not to do concrete at all. So there's no one right answer for every situation. If you've seen one farm, you've seen one farm. So we're trying to follow the produce from the field to cold storage and figure out where things can be improved. Harvest, storage, wash pack. And so after this workshop, we're going to ask you to do a little homework and we're going to ask you to follow up with us. But some things that maybe you'll be inspired to do are just diagram and redesign your workspace or your wash pack area. If you never sat down and diagrammed it before, Monica and Russell are going to share some really key reasons why. You might repurpose some materials like PVC. Tiana can share about that or using a hoop house instead of a structure for your wash pack area. Maybe after 10 years of buying the same $10 nozzle at the seed and feed, you're finally gonna get that $70 nozzle, maybe from Johnny's or Remco, something that's gonna make a huge difference for a little bit of money. Or maybe just write down three SOPs about three things that your employees are always asking you about or three things you wish that they would ask you about instead of doing the same thing over and over again, which means right after this workshop, maybe between 70, 7.45 and eight o'clock tonight, you're going to use that document that Han sent you, and I bet he could even put a link in the chat box at some point and tell us what your plan is and then reach out as needed. So technically, y'all have already paid for this assistance. This is a USDA. I don't actually know how the government funding works. Maybe it comes from taxes. Maybe it's just made up money. But let's pretend it's your tax dollars at work. So please reach out to us and help us work with you to put these improvements in place and then follow up, send us some pictures, and maybe we can use those photos or other things to help more farmers in the future. I'll shoot that link in the, in the chat box in just a sec. Thanks, Hans. And so you're gonna be thinking about what's a high priority issue on my farm that could use a low cost solution. Jeff, that might be wheels. You've got concrete now. It might just be putting some wheels on those tables. Brian, it might just be thinking about SOPs. And then what can this group help you resolve or think through? So the first farm we're going to talk about is Love is Love Cooperative Farm in Mansfield, Georgia. Could we my, actually oh. could maybe pause before that and just have the folks that just came in just introduce themselves? Is that could that work for you? Or yeah, I think that quick? could work out great. Yeah, yeah. So I'm trying to read the list here and now figure out. So yeah, new folks just come in. We were just about to launch into the first presentation. And I'm just, we're just taking a minute here. Billy's running this workshop very gracefully um, and well, uh, but yeah, a little, a minute just to introduce yourself. I think that's Paula, Georgette, and maybe Jason and Casey, real quick, uh, where you're from and um, maybe what you're trying to do or why you've come to this workshop, what's, what's on your mind uh, and just real quick. So Paula, um, or Billy, if you want to take over from here, I think it's Paula, Georgette, and Casey. And I'll go hunt for that link to um, put in the chat box. That sounds great, Hans. Yeah, Paula, if you want to go first and let us know who you are, your farm name, where you're located, and why you're here today. And turn your video on if you can. Oh, it looks like we have Casey here, too. Hi. Hey, thanks for letting us join. My husband, Clay, is on his way. Um, so we own Foster Brady Farm and our farm is in Walton County, Georgia. 
So we're close to Athens. We actually live in Athens, Georgia. All right, way cool. We're neighbors. We should get coffee sometime. Certainly. <laughs> and then Georgette, will you introduce yourself, your farm name, where you're oh. located and why you're here today? Um, okay, so I'm Georgette and we have, our farm is Westview Farm and we're in Cambridge, Vermont. And we're having a regular thunderstorm going on at this time. So, um, and I'm always anxious to hear and follow what's going on with uh, these webinars. So we've been out all day and then we just came in before the rain started. All right, well, I'm glad that we got y'all here and I'm glad, I hope that you're dry and comfortable. On. <laughs> Same, fingers crossed. Yeah. Did Paula, Paula, did you go yet? I, I may be misremembering, but. I, I did, yeah. I think I failed to say why we are participating, but um, yeah. yeah, we are we are in need of many improvements on our farm. <laughs> so our buildings were mostly inherited from generations previous. So they're falling up. They were retrofitted for our needs and they're falling apart. And, Lots of stuff breaking down at one time. All right, cool. Hopefully today we'll help identify one or two of those things to start with. That sounds a bit paralyzing to have so many <laughs> things at once. It can be for sure. But starting where you are is good and we're on that. <laughs> and Casey, I think uh, last but not least, Hi, I'm Casey. Uh, I work over at Morning Glory Farm. We're on Martha's Vineyard off of the coast of Massachusetts. Um, I do post harvest and distribution over there. So i um, been doing it for about two years. So these webinars have been super helpful just for reference to be able to figure out how we can make things more efficient, how we can keep moving things through and um, keep growing as much food as possible. Very cool. Those are good goals to have. And I did put that link in for the little, it's a very simple planning document and just, you know, helps to get your ideas on paper. So it's in the chat box and it was also sent to you. So go ahead and download it and um, start writing now during the presentation or right after would be great. All right. Thanks, Hans. So Monica and Russell, y'all are up. And the first thing we're going to ask you is just kind of what we're looking at and, and what condition the farm is at right now. And I'm also gonna let you know, I'm gonna start a timer for 10 minutes so that we can do our best to ten, stick to 10 it. 10 minutes per question or 10 minutes total? Uh, 10 minutes total, and then there'll be more time for question and answer afterwards. <laughs> okay, um, I started it. Awesome, thank you. Thanks, Billy. So um, we are on Love is Love Cooperative Farm. Um, located in Mansfield, Georgia, which is pretty close or relatively close to Athens. Um, when we just acquired uh, this property in March, right? I think we si ended up signing our lease in April. We were working with the conservation fund um, to acquire this land. So we have a lease to purchase option with them. So. We're gonna be leasing for the first five years and hopefully by year five, uh, we are purchasing this property. Um, there is, as far as farming goes, like very little infrastructure, if any, there is a house. So we could get water and electricity. Other than that, there's no farming infrastructure. Um, since March, we have drilled a well, uh, kind of in the middle of the pasture that you see. Um, we've opened up some fields, we've planted, some sweet potatoes, some sunchokes. Um, we have a big fall planting push coming up, hopefully next week, um, if the rain will give us a chance. Um, what else? Yeah, so our farm, the, the space that we're leasing with the intention to purchase in five years is a total of 69 acres. Um, and our goal, we're going into the fall, we're going to be having, we'll have four acres in production. Um, so at the end of the, our first year, we'll have four acres. And the goal is to get to 20 acres by year five. So in terms of planning our wash pack, um, what we really wanted to do was design and build something that was 
cost effective um, and utilize some of the resources that we had already kind of gathered up knowing over the past year or so, knowing that we were going to start this farm um, and, and build a wash pack that was capable of kind of handling that, uh, that progression with our, with our scaling up. Um, so that was one of our big focuses with the scrub grant as well. Yeah, and for reference, the wash pack uh, is going to go just north of the house. Um, like, I mean, I'm pointing at it, but you guys can see. Uh, <laughs> if you see where the house is by the pond and then like this square hedge, it's going to go. Yes, right there, right where the arrow is. <laughs> That's where we plan to have our wash pack. Um, not as central as we like in our fields, but still close enough to the electricity and municipal water. Um, actually, I think it'll end up being on well water, but still, yeah. um, that close, ended up being the best spot for us. Close to water, close to power, and Dry close water. to the driveway. Yeah. All right, way cool. And so y'all, I think you mentioned you didn't have a lot of buildings on the farm, but will you talk a little bit about this space and then we'll get to your drawing and design. Okay. Um, so this barn, um, came available to Russell and I like three years ago, maybe. I don't know. At this point, yeah. Somebody was selling it. They uh, got it for half off at one of those, you know, places where they sell these kinds of sheds and buildings. Um, and it ended up being too small for them. So they called us and asked us if we wanted it. And it was $4,800 um, and seems pretty easy to build. So we went ahead and just bought it even before we knew where we were gonna land um, on our future farm. Um, just a little leap of faith, I guess. Yeah. We thought it was such a good deal that if we don't use it, we could at least sell it to another farmer friend. Um, yeah, it's a 36 by 20 structure, pre-engineered structure that when we purchased it, we didn't know if it was gonna be our work barn, if we were gonna set it up and build it out as a living space on raw land. It was just something that we knew was a good deal and so we purchased it. Um, and then when we got to this property, we realized that uh, wash pack and storage facility were gonna be the, some of the first things we needed to build out. Um, and we had some, the two spaces, the two spaces that were here on the property and potentially available were a, car, a small carport and, um, the house garage, uh, which those two things we've utilized for storage while we, uh, so um, qu we quickly realized that we, we wanted to utilize this for our washing and packing facility. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think we wanted to keep washing and packing away from storage and just like, we want to keep that more sanitary um, and have a cleaner organized space. Yeah, that, that's great. And so, I, which leads us to this drawing, which is something that I've been real excited about. Um, I call it a drawing. I think Russell once called it a dollhouse design. But this to me is like a really low cost, but high investment thing, the, the time that y'all have taken to diagram design and use it as a communication tool. So if you wanna talk about what motivated you to do this, how many times maybe you've redrawn this or moved the paper around and, and just what you've learned. Yeah. Um, okay, so we are a worker owned cooperative. We have five farmers and we have a lot of meetings. Um, so we all knew that we needed to build a wash pack and we all had a lot of different visions and ideas. But, and you know, it's also COVID time. So we were doing this all over conference calls or Zoom calls. Um, so we were trying. I really needed, I'm a visual person and I really needed to get everybody's thoughts and ideas down on paper. And I wanted us to be able to talk about it and see the same things, you know, get on the same page. Did we freeze? No. Okay. Get on the same page. Um, and, and yeah, ha just have a clear discussion and make any clear changes and be able to agree to any changes. Um, also, to back up a little bit, we did another farmer friend kind of posted on like a farmer thread that we're on through Google or whatever about some walk-in cooler panels that were that were available up for grabs. 
Um, so there are two walk-ins that were 12 by 12 by 24. Uh, yeah. 12 by 24. So we were able to um, get this for free, but it costed $300 in transport. Um, so we wanted to figure out how do these walk-in coolers fit with this prefab barn that we have. So these are the things we have. How can we make this puzzle like fit together and fit our needs amongst all the like conversation and ideas. So one night I just had to like draw it out. I drew it out to scale. Russell helped me out and started like cutting out like pallets uh, and like, yeah, little pieces of paper that were like the size of a pallet or a pop-up table or our dunk, dunk tanks that we already had, stuff like that so that we could just kind of play around and with any of the rooms or bays and just move pieces around and see how the flow um, of our wash pack would go. And then of course we like presented it to the rest of our group and they got to play with it a little bit and we got to talk about drainage and it, it just like gave us space to have a clear conversation and streamline communications so that we all had the same vision. <clears throat> Yeah, it is a, a great communication tool and it also allowed us to experiment with the space before we actually had it built. Um, so we could kind of walk through what a wash pack uh, day might look like, even though we didn't have it constructed. Um, where certain pro where roots would go versus where tender grains would go, um, what it would look like coming in from the field, what it would look like going through wash different wash lines into the cooler and then out of the cooler onto packing tables or into trucks so it gave us a lot of flexibility in a way to kind of think through things in a really concrete way and explain them to all of the other folks who had to be involved in the decision making process in a very clear way um, that we could all grasp and all kind of play around with um, so we could really get on the same page yeah and it really helped us think through our washing and packing like seasonally so in the summertime when you're not washing as many, or at least down here, when you're not washing as many greens and doing more like tomatoes and peppers and sorting, like we can keep things dynamic and move things around. Whereas like, you know, on the spring, winter and fall seasons, when we are doing a lot of like greens washing, like how do, how do things change then? How does the walk pack, wash pack, you know, change then? And where are we moving the root washer? And do we even need the root washer? And how can we get that out of the way and stuff like that? Um, but yeah, th I think this is the second time I drew it. Um, the first drawing, we went and, you know, we talked to um, you, Billy, and Hans, and I think Chris and Andrew, and Andrew uh, with the scrub grant, and y'all gave us a lot of great feedback. Um, Russell's dad is also an architect, so he gave us a lot of really good feedback. And then, of course, our team, like our, our farm partners, you know, and their, um, you know, 13 years of experience, you know, gave us good feedback, too. Um, so this was the second iteration of the drawing. And we've only we've made some additions to this that I haven't drawn out, but they're pretty simple. Um, Very cool. Thanks, y'all. That was also, y'all are professionals. That was exactly 10 minutes, Monica, to the second. Um, so we, we will come back to Monica and Russell, but first we're going to move over to Gordon. Gordon, are you still with us? I am. Thanks, Billy. Um, so we're at Ten Mothers Farm in Cedar Grove, North Carolina. We are a one acre vegetable farm that grows for 230 CSA shares um, and we grow year round. The thing that we did and the reason why I'm on this call is that we put our wash pack in a high tunnel. Um, and not only that, but we built one 30 by 100 foot high tunnel and we put wash pack in the front of it. So that's what you see, right? As you walk in the tunnel right there, the first 25 feet of the tunnels where we do all of our wash pack. You can see on the left there, that's like actually where the washing and packing happens. And on the right, that's a um, walk-in cooler. The next 25 feet of the tunnel is where we have our propagation area. So like our greenhouse where we start all of our seedlings. And then the last uh, 50 feet of the tunnel is production. So that's, you know, soil growing space, um, you know, where we had tomatoes this summer, for example. 
And the reason we did that is um, we were in a situation where we rented land for the first three years of our farm, and then we were able to buy the land that we're on now. And um, we had to go, that land was totally raw. So it, you know, um, sounds like pretty similar to Love is Love Farm. We um, had to set up very quickly. We finished up our CSA season on the rented land in December of one year. And then we needed to be, you know, delivering CSA shares four months later at the end of April in the next year. And so um, that just meant we didn't have a lot of time and we didn't have a lot of money to, you know, uh, be able to turn all, we, there were a lot of things we had to invest in on the farm. So we didn't have the money necessarily to build a whole pack shed, to build a propagation house, to also build high tunnels where we would grow. Um, and so we looked at this as a solution that would be very quick to put up, something that we, you know, where we could control the process and something where we would save money. Um, you know, in that short period, it, we were interested in being on our own schedule because, you know, we could work when we needed to and as long as we needed to, rather than hiring out some of those building projects to a contractor, especially building like a pole barn or a pack shed, because that's just something that none of us bring those skills, like we're not carpenters. But we did know how to build high tunnels. Um, my wife and I, and also um, our longtime employee, Luke, we had all worked on farms where we had built tunnels in the past. So it was something that we could, you know, wrap our brains around and then we, we felt like we could manage doing that in those first, you know, few crazy months when we we're getting the farm set up. Um, I should say that we're not the first people to do this either. Um, you know, this we worked on a farm. We worked at a Four Season Farm in Maine, Elliot Coleman's farm, and his wash pack is in a high tunnel. And then also another uh, farm that's been an inspiration for us, Never Sink Farm in New York. Connor Crickmore, the farmer there, he also has his wash pack in a high tunnel. So we were really just taking those ideas and figuring out how we could do it in a hot climate here in North Carolina in the Southeast. Um, how much did it cost? So setting it up, building the tunnel, which we got from Tunnel Vision Hoops, um, which if you're building a high tunnel, I would highly recommend. Um, building the tunnel, putting in the floor and putting in a heater, which you can kind of see the heater next to that fan back against that back wall. Um, that cost us about $20,000 total. Um, compared to the cost of like building, you know, a high tunnel just for production, building another tunnel just for propagation, and then also building a pole barn, that would have cost a lot more than $20,000, especially if we had to hire out building the pole barn or something like that. Um, it took us about a week, uh, three people, I guess, two, uh, one person was only there a few days. So like two and a half people, it took us a week to build the tunnel and set up the floor as well. Um, and that's partly because we had experience building tunnels, but really it's also because tunnel vision tunnels go up really fast. So that's one of the main reasons why I recommend them. Um, to, you know, put in that heater and set up the walk-in and the wash pack took a little bit longer than that, but not longer than another few days. The walk-in cooler, we just bought, um, you know, like a ready to go walk-in cooler from Coolbot. So that took like two hours to set up. Um, the heater took longer and the wash pack, we mostly, uh, bought like table, like laundry tables that we can convert to spray tables and uh, livestock troughs that we could turn into dunk tanks and stainless steel tables. So it was mostly off the shelf um, and relatively easy to set up. And you can see we just use like bulb crates to keep things off the floor and stuff like that. So setting up that wash pack um, was mostly off the shelf stuff that was pretty easy. And it meant that um, we it was sort of like instant farm. It worked. It met the goals of being cost effective and something that we could set up really quickly. Um, and I can say it really helps our farm because it makes everything centrally located too. You know, so we've got the wash pack. That's sort of like the headquarters of the farm. That's where, you know, we meet in the morning. Um, that's kind of like the buzzing center of the farm. The greenhouse is right there. Um, so also, you know, that's a place that we need to be one or two or 10 times a day sometimes. So we got the greenhouse right there. And then the back production area there is, is, you know, a place where we put high value crops and, and that's one of the most productive spaces on the farm. And so um, it's just very centrally located and very compact. One of the things that I'm most pleased with is something that um, Billy is showing the slide of right now is the floor. It's worked really well for us. So in that time period um, and with, you know, not an unlimited amount of funds to invest, we didn't feel like we were able to put in a concrete floor, which would be ideal for a wash pack. And, you know, I know many farms starting out are in the same situation, but 
in talking to a farmer that we had worked for, we came up with the idea um, of using landscape fabric. So the bottom layer of the floor is just black landscape fabric that we put down right on the soil. So, you know, we didn't even till it or, or anything. We just put it right down on the sod. Um, and that served to, you know, kill the grass and prevent anything from growing up. Then we put down about four, maybe six inches of pea gravel. And so that was chosen to become like the base of the floor, but specifically so that it would drain. And then on top of that, we put white landscape fabric. So we chose that white landscape fabric, white, so that it wouldn't heat up as much because heat rather than cold is, is more the problem we're contending with. And also because then we have a surface that we can clean. So we can sweep it, um, you, you know, we can, we can put things on it. It's not gravel. So, you know, if say like some greens fall onto the floor, it's easy to just pick them right back up. They're not gonna like slowly amass into gravel and turn into mud. Um, and the floor, it, it drains, quite well. I mean, it's not perfect, you know, like landscape fabric is not, is, you know, it takes a little bit of time for water to percolate through it, but we're never like standing in puddles when we're doing our wash packs. So we've been really happy with the floor. And Gordon, um, sorry, how yeah. long has this floor lasted? How long ago did you all install this? This is the, so these pictures were taken like a few weeks ago. This is our third season. And we use, I mean, we're on that floor every day because we, we sell produce, you know, 50 weeks of the year. Um, so it's held up pretty well. It's getting a little frayed in some spots, um, but you can see like it's not it's not as easy to clean as concrete, but it is certainly easier to clean than gravel. Mm -hmm. And you had said you all started with two and a half, three people. How many employees are you fitting in this wash pack space? So our whole team now is five people full time who are on the farm every day. So um, we can have all five people working in there. Very cool. Um, and then I, kn I know that you love hoop houses. I was just wondering, we were going to poll the audience now with an actual poll. So y'all have to either come off mute or go in the chat box, but just what y'all think this area is, what they're using it for. Is it, the, is this your barn? Yeah. First one's right. I mean, so the same, that we even put this up right before we built the wash pack, but basically same problem. We didn't, we, we didn't feel like we had the capacity to put up a barn or put up a tool shed. And so we put up a caterpillar tunnel because that's cheap. You know, that tunnel cost like $1,900, I think. And we could, we put it up in a day. It took one day to put up. And now that's where we, you know, do all of our storage. Those are like our harvest carts and um, that's a tool rack behind it. And then sort of at the far end, that's where we store row cover and things like that. Um, you can see in the middle, there actually is a walk-in cooler in there now. That's because that was our original walk-in and we grew out of it. So we had to get a bigger walk-in, which is the one in the wash pack now. That is now like our cooler uh, cooler temperature walk-in where we store tomatoes. And it's not ideal to have it right there, but, but it's the only other covered space we have. We're a small farm on a small space, so we don't have a lot of room to put up more buildings. And Gordon, in an earlier conversation, I think you had said something to me like, if you had unlimited funds, may maybe and unlimited skills, you might have looked into building a big barn or a big structure. But are are you feeling happy with the high tunnels? Would you keep putting them up if you had more space? Um, yeah, we are happy. I mean, so we're three years in. I think at this point, we figured we probably would be on the verge of building an actual building um, that we would move the wash pack into. But three years in, it's working. And so I don't see us putting up a building for wash pack anytime in the immediate future. Um, you know, if we were to put up a pole barn it, in our climate, it would be hot too, just like our tunnel is. So we do a lot to try to manage ventilation in the tunnel and we use a lot of shade cloth and we have fans in there. So we try to keep it as cool as possible. A pole barn would also be hot. If we wanted to upgrade, we would probably want to try to get a building that was actually conditioned so we could keep it cool and then also keep it warm easily. And that would be such an expensive project that while it's possible we could do it in the future, um, it's not in the cards right now because the high tunnel is working. And um, it, you know there are definitely some trade-offs, like it does get hot in there. I would say that with all the ventilation, it's a little bit cooler, maybe two to three degrees cooler, or at least it feels less intensely hot in there than outside on a hot day. But um, that is a definite trade-off. And sometimes it's like in the winter, we want to keep the greenhouse warm because we're trying to grow seedlings, but we want to keep the walk-in cool. So there's sometimes when the different functions of the tunnel are sort of going against each other. Um, and then also it's not, you know, it's a high tunnel. It's not a building. If we were to get like a crazy hurricane, I would be worried that, that you know, that the tunnel would be a higher risk 
place to have all of those important functions of the farm. But we chose the sturdiest tunnel that we could afford for that reason too, so that it would give us a little bit more peace of mind. Thank you. And la last question. And I want to say you would have ended on time if I wasn't asking you these questions. Uh, so great job. Thank you. The my, well, I have a recent obsession with restaurant mats. Will you just talk about those mats in the middle of your barn yeah. tool shed and why they're there and how you picked them out? Yeah, well, so we um, we originally got those for the wash pack, actually, because it's a place where you're standing a lot, especially the farms that you know have concrete floors will often get restaurant mats. But the thing is, the gravel floor in our wash pack is kind of soft. And so um, it's not like our knees hurt from being in there all day. And the restaurant mats were just a place that were really easily accumulating dirt and like picking them up and cleaning them was a lot of work. So we moved them out of the wash pack. That's a spot in the storage tunnel where um, water accumulates. It's like a low spot. And so um, it helps give us better footing as you're walking in and out. Very cool. Thank you. So y'all will we'll have plenty of time for uh, Q&A with Gordon and then of course with Monica and Russell. But before we do that, Laura, we'll pass the mic to you to talk about your farm. All right. So again, I'm Laura. I own a full plate farm in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. Um, my former partner and I also started on vacant or virgin land. Um, so same sort of issues where we're facing, uh, we had to put in, we had to drill a well, we had to bring in power. Uh, we originally had to clear some saplings and some small trees um, and then open open ground and come up for come up with a place for ourselves to live. And so lots of kind of challenges right at the beginning, beginning which um, tax your resources, uh, obviously time and money. So, um, when thinking about our wash pack uh, situation, originally it, it didn't end up being very high priority. For the first couple of years, we functioned um, with outdoor kind of like pop-up tables, some hoses, some bins. And, um, it, was, it was very low tech for a little while there. Um, and then as the farm grew and we started moving more produce, like the need for a more permanent setup uh, became obvious. And it just so happened that at the time, my sister was um, in the process of forming a collective farm downstate, downstate Michigan. And one of the businesses that was being absorbed into the collective uh, was getting rid of their sort of low cost wash pack setup, which was this uh, carport. Um, just a super simple carport and a few sinks. So I, I kind of like happened into this second hand because it was no longer needed by this business. Um, so that was the original motivation for making something like this work, um, just because it sort of fell into my lap, I guess. <laughs> um, but it has functioned pretty well. I just set up, as you can see, a, a really simple pallet floor. Um, the structure is like secured to the pallets because we do live in a pretty windy area, like wind coming off the lake is somewhat of a concern. So that's, it's secured. Um, and then as we went along, we just sort of figured out what, what sort of uh, workflow seemed to suit our needs and added tables and sinks and a little storage area for our crates and stuff and uh, harvest containers. So yeah, nothing too too crazy. You can kind of see in this photo, we do have um, elevated uh, water lines and hoses coming down in various locations just for filling sinks and uh, at the spray table and whatnot. Um, a little magnetic knife bar back there and holding some, some, uh, some tools and, and stuff. Um, I would say, yeah, I guess you asked us to talk about the cost, super low cost. I've probably invested a total of about $125 in this structure. So again, the carport came free. I did buy a new cover for it. Um, and then I've spent a little bit of money on poly pipe and fittings and hoses, and all that good stuff. But um, it's been a very affordable option. And I, of course that was part of the appeal. Um, lessons learned. Let's see. Uh, the pallet floor 
is functional. It has the advantage of um, keeping you off the wet ground uh, if water begins to pool, if like drain water begins to pool. Um, it also has the advantage of you can wash stuff through the slats. So there's like cleanup is really easy. <laughs> You're not having to sweep a bunch of material off. You can kind of just spray it off and it falls down below. Um, on the, the cons for the flooring is that it can be kind of ha hazardous. So we've had to replace, you know, some of the, the pallet um, boards here and there where uh, rot or holes would develop. Um, so just, it's maybe not as uh, OSHA approved as I would like it to be. <laughs> um, let's see. And Laura, so these are, these are kind of, well, one I want to say, I wish I was like a cool wild grandpa and I was so excited about pallets, but I'm like nervous, grumpy grandpa and I, <laughs> or OSHA grandpa instead yeah. of cool grandpa. But yeah, the, the pallets do make me nervous, but they're also such a cool solution yeah. at the same time. Um, and then I want to say, so you, you had participated in this project and so y'all see it says before on the bottom. If you don't mind, I thought I'd advance to a couple of the after, and if you want to identify some of the changes you decided to make. Yeah. Um, also, I just love that these are like brighter. It's like the after. Y'all did a really good job with the contrast on these. <laughs> okay. So talking about some of those changes you've made over the past month, some of these low cost. Yeah. So one of the limitations of the space is we are trying to store uh, store stuff out of the weather because we're also really limited on storage space on the farm. So that's taking up a portion of the space. Um, and it also, um, we didn't have a great way to do our washing inside of the actual covered space. So what we did is on the left side there, we added just another little row of pallets, which allow us to keep things off the ground um, as we're scrubbing them out and then also provide some drying space over on the left. And then once, once things are clean and dry, we can move them over to kind of like the, the clean storage area on the right. So that was a little helpful improvement. Um, obviously it's open air, which I really like um, in the last photo, but um, we do have uh, pretty strong prevailing winds as I mentioned from the Northwest. And so sometimes when you're there at the sinks, washing greens, dunking, you know, you've got your hands wet the whole time, it gets pretty chilly, especially in the, the shoulder season. So we added just like a really simple wind blocking tarp right there to keep us just a bit more out of the weather. And that was really nice. Oh, I guess you can see it better there. Um, we added a few hooks recently to um, help manage hoses. Uh, one in particular to help keep it off the ground. Just a super simple improvement. And then in the before photos, you probably didn't notice, but we kind of had some of our um, like cleaning supplies scattered around or kind of stashed underneath the sinks, not in a very centralized location. So we just created a, um, a really simple caddy near where we have the new, <laughs> Billy's like flipping around like crazy here. <laughs> um, so here's the caddy you can see, which is near where we're doing the bin washing. And it's just a way to keep things um, off the ground, easy to reach, centralized. And it's obviously just like a brace band and a bucket. We couldn't get much simpler. Um, and some holes drilled in the bucket. And then uh, one of the other things we thought about uh, in terms of improving this space is the farm, as I said, has really limited storage and where I'm storing most of my consumables like bags and clamshells and, um, you know, mesh netting and things that are used for packing vegetables mainly is in a, a trailer that's not it's not far from the packing shed but it's not as close as I would like it to be so sometimes there's like some running back and forth so we've talked about adding um, a little shelving unit like a wire shelf like you would find in a closet almost um, and that would be kind of along the back of the shed toward the right I guess, yeah, <laughs> like up, up a ways. But um, so we talked about adding that and um, just creating some space to store at least some consumables. Not all of them would fit there, but um, yeah, this is kind of our super simple setup. 
I feel like we should talk about food safety. I didn't make anybody else talk about it. Oh. Uh, do you want to talk about your hand washing? Oh, yes, sure. Um, so as I said, we're, we're still in the process of building a lot of infrastructure on the farm. So uh, employees use an outhouse currently for their for um, the restroom facility. So just to make sure, in addition to obviously sanitizer in that location, we added a, a little hand washing station here in the pack shed, which allows us to make sure we're adhering to food safety regulations. Way cool, thank you. I, so I feel like, especially this cleaning, cleaning caddy, this feels like a classic <laughs> educator suggestion and that those educators aren't on right now, even though it's being recorded and you're not gonna tell them either way. So there's a lot of pressure here, but have you found that it's helped having it just off the ground in the bucket like that, even just that small change, has it created a difference? Yeah, I actually think it has. I'm not fishing underneath the sinks to try to find what I need to, to wash things. It's all right there. It does make a difference. That's what I was just thinking about too, is all the times I've gotten, both in a restaurant and on a farm, had to get under the sink Mm -hmm. to like grab something or to find something as you're pulling the brush out it is just covered in like gross things that were on the ground then maybe you clean the brush maybe you don't so right. that's very cool thank you laura and location 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 like that's the like having it right there so the minute you think about it it's there um and can i ask was that a paper towel rack up in that, in the, under the eave of that carport cover? Yeah, for the hand washing station. That's so cool. <laughs> I don't get excited about too much, but. It's all very low tech, but it, it works mostly. <laughs> very cool, thank you. So y'all now now that i i got so many questions but i get to i get to talk to a lot of these people all the time so we do want to open it up to the audience if y'all have questions or maybe something that you're struggling with on the farm that you want to share with the people on this call um now is your time and i'll do my best not to call on people but some of y'all have real kind faces and i feel like you won't be upset and if it's possible to un to put your video on that's great Hi, Laura. I'm I'm very inspired by your um by your wash station because I with my situation I don't like own the land and so I'm trying to build a lot something a lot more like temporary, you know what I mean? And so like I've had the idea of like you know building the floor like with the fabric or putting down gravel and things, but then it had crossed my mind like the pallets. I really like that the pallet idea and to see, you know, you be able to do that and it work well for you is is good. And I actually just purchased some some plastic pallets. So I'm gonna try the plastic pallets <laughs> and see how that works out. Um, but those have holes in it too, you know, so it's kind of like, you know, what Billy was saying that like that danger of, you know, not being able to, you know, have like a secure um like bottom but um have you ever like considered like um like the mats like the restaurant mats have you tried to put anything on top of the pallets or anything like that you know i haven't moved in that direction um just because i what we've had has worked sufficiently well i guess um are mm -hmm. you thinking just to kind of cover the slats so that yeah kept an ankle yeah i was wondering how that would work you know or even like an outdoor like mat but then that would defeat like the purpose of like me filling in the holes you know how you were talking about how things can kind of just fall through the holes which kind of makes cleaning easier yeah. for you too so i've been trying to figure that out too like if i should you know just like try to cover it up or leave those holes just like open you know yeah so. i've also been selective in my palette um recruitment essentially <laughs> like there are some that are well suited for that sort of an application and some that have wider spaces between the the boards on top so i'm looking for the ones with the smaller spaces in between so they're just like a tiny bit safer and uh, yeah. I've, I've been able to piece together enough of those that it's um yeah it's sufficient <laughs> and i imagine you got to get them all the same height too 
Yeah, there's a little bit of leveling <laughs> that I did. You know, I would kind of shim some of them up uh, with mm. with other other pieces beneath. Okay. Laura, did you put oh, landscape fabric under the pallets? I didn't actually. It just sounds sad. Hmm. We also use pallets in our uh, walk-in fridge to be able to organize most of like heavy crops, like peppers, eggplants, and stuff. And I've recently found some solid plastic ones, um, and I've collected as many as I can now. <laughs> but they they are out there um, with no holes on them because we had a really similar issues where. Uh, when people weren't looking, especially when they're carrying their potatoes in or something that was heavy, it was so easy for them to just like have an ankle fall right through or mm. if they weren't keeping an eye out. But they are out there. <laughs> okay, good. Thank you for sharing. Casey, have you been buying those or are they getting donated or you're finding them at a restaurant you work with? It's a restaurant that we work with recently got them in. So they've been uh, dropping them off in exchange for some produce. Very cool. I have a question for Gordon, if that's okay. Um, are you ever worried about um, working in a high tunnel during like a lightning storm? I know I get terrified when I'm in a high tunnel during lightning. Um, I don't know if you'll have that concern or if I'm just kind of a wimp. <laughs> no, well, if you're a wimp, then I'm a wimp too. Um, because Yeah, we had a thunderstorm this morning and I was worried about it. Yeah. Um, I mean, my sense is, is that, you know, you're safer in a building certainly than in a high tunnel would be my guess. Um, I, we have a policy where if the lighting's getting bad, I tell people to run into our house or into their cars, um, but no one has ever done it. I also tried to do some research on that because it is something I think about a lot and I couldn't find any instance of anyone saying that in a high tunnel, there had been an injury due to lightning strike. Now I could be wrong, about that. But my thought is, is that, you know, a high tunnel essentially is grounded um, because the ground posts are going to the ground. And so while it's not a perfect situation, especially if you were touching some of the metal or very close to it, I would be pretty concerned. But my sense is, is that it's certainly safer than just being out in the open. I have some secondhand experience to back that up, Gordon. Recently, a, a very a farm I used to work on, um, they, uh, they were in a high tunnel and it was hit by lightning right when they were in it. And um, Mike Collins, the farmer, said it was the weirdest experience he's ever had. Like just the feeling was unbelievable. But he also said it was it was OK. Like so. And, it, and that's true. I'll back Gordon up like especially and especially if you're dry or you have boots on or whatever, you're in a shell that's grounded. And so the minute the electricity goes down the ground, it disperses instantly over a huge um, amount of space. So you're getting maybe some of it, but um, it's not gonna, I, I doubt it would kill you unless there was something you were holding on to the pole or somehow in direct line with that ground. That's so good to hear. Yeah, and I talk about it with our, our team, you know, like if, if, there's, if there's a thunderstorm nearby, like, be mindful of what you're touching in the high tunnel and where you are in the high tunnel. Um, Monica, I have a question back for you, if I can ask that quickly. I was wondering, you know, thinking about fitting wash pack in tight spaces, um, was there, what were some of the, or what are some of the hardest things that you're looking at to fit and how, you know, like, how are you trying to conceptualize or deal with fitting in tight spaces? Well, um, we couldn't fit the coolers in that building. <laughs> <laughs> so um, we've got the concrete pad that we're going to have is bigger than the actual building. And then we're going to put just a simple um, roof over top of um, those two coolers. And it just so happened, like one of the great things about laying the plans out beforehand is it just so happened that, you know, we've got two 12 foot wide coolers and a 36 foot wide barn. And so um, it kind of perfectly divided that pad up into thirds. And so... Um, you know, I think it's kind of just been trying to maximize what space we have and make sure that we have the room that we need for specific tasks, um, as well as the flexibility to move stuff around, yeah. um, to make more. We do want to get an AZS, uh, conveyor washer, probably like in year three or something, not right now, but soon, um, so I'm wondering how that's gonna fit into the space, but 
I mean, maybe we won't be able to get it. Um, I don't know. Yeah. We also, we also kind of, um, you know, we thought about it in terms of what spaces within the, within that structure would be used for different things. So we have our root washing station, then our grains washing and packing station or things that need to get hydro cooled. Um, and then I, and then we have like another little, uh, 12 by 20 bay that we can set up tables in for packing, um, as well as another 12 by 20 bay for holding all of our packing and washing supplies. And so, um, you know, while it might get tight, none of those things or those things are likely, not all of them are gonna be happening right at the same time. Um, and then also again, just like with tight spaces, what becomes really important is how things flow around them. Um, so <laughs> you might only have space for one person to work, but if no one has to pass them, you know, if everything's passing in front of them on the table and then going around the back end and into the cooler and you never have to cross over those pathways, um, a tight space becomes a lot more workable uh, than, you know, if you know where everything is going and it's not crossing paths. Yeah, and I, I just wanna add that our root washing station is gonna be outside. It's still on the concrete next to the, um, two coolers um, with a garage door able to come inside to the to the other wash pack area with the greens where the greens would be washed inside. Sorry, it's our dog's dinner time. <laughs> if you can hear him. Cool, thank you. Danny, I can't remember if you came in late and got to introduce yourself. If you haven't introduced yourself, Will you tell us your farm name and where you're at? And then is there anything on your mind? Yeah, sorry, I got in late. Um, my name is Danny. I um, am working on a collective farm business um, called Common Ground with Sarah, who's also on this call. Um, and I did have a question about um, uh, pros and cons with dunk tanks versus sinks, um, like dunk tanks with hoses going in, if that's just a, a cheaper option um, than getting kind of like a deep restaurant type sink, um, if the farmers have thoughts on how they made the, that decision. Um, I can, I'll say that we use dunk tanks and then Definitely, uh, unless you find a source for a restaurant sink that's surprisingly cheap, a dunk tank like a livestock trough, you know, with a drain installed tends to be cheaper and was cheap for us and also really easy for us. Um, I would say the main advantage is that they're really big. So um, you can hydro cool a lot of produce pretty quickly. Like we can overturn a crate uh, full of lettuce or kale or whatever it might be right into the tank and there's enough room to easily move it around and uh, wash it around. Um, we don't do like the triple cooling of our greens. So, um, you know, we don't need three bays right next to each other. And this space of like a hundred gallon tank is a real benefit for us. I will say the just from a produce safety angle, the, um, you know, if you have one big tank that you're hydro cooling with, it's a good idea to either have an additional tank because you get a dilution factor of the bacteria in the tank, or uh, uh, maybe the three tanks could be actually a, more like a risk reduction factor. We did some studies at UVM where there's a, about a tenfold drop or 90% drop in bacterial load between successive dunk tanks, uh, or use some kind of a sanitizer in a single tank, like a big, a big tank uh, that you're using for a few hours, either uh, the peroxyacetic acid would be the top choice because it's pretty durable, like the um, tsunami or, or a biosafe um, um, sanitate five or something along those lines. And I'm, I'm happy to share any information if anyone's interested. Um, I've also, I've also noticed in what, like when washing in water and dunk tanks or sinks or whatever, um, 
depending on what you're washing and the volume that you're washing, uh, I tend to find that having like a wider sink, one that presents like more surface area on top of the water, tends to get things cleaner faster than something that might be deeper. Um, so if you have like two, two wash containers that have the same amount of volume and one of them is um, wider as opposed to deeper, I would, I would go with the wider um, wash tub, tank, sink, whatever it is. I'm hoping Andy, Andy Chamberlain came in a little bit late, but he's one of our organizers in our tech wizard um, for the scrub project. And he just posted something in chat that I wanted to talk about and he just introduced himself. Hey there, um, this is Andy Chamberlain. I work for UVM Extension Ag Engineering and Produce Safety. So like Han said, I work with this team and a pack shed is kind of my specialty the last few years here at Extension. Um, our blog is full of various resources. If you haven't checked it out, everything from sinks to hoses to case studies from, um, we'll say medium to large builds. This is one um, aspect of the pack shed that we're lacking is the smaller scale, lower cost options. So I took a few notes today so we can hopefully get something out there on this as well. You guys are great examples of uh, like using a high tunnel and, and a pre-built shed. Those are, those are great. So I'll be sure to link this webinar in in the upcoming blog post but uh, you were talking about sinks so i just posted a short link go.uvm.edu slash sinks that'll take you to a blog post that we've put together that just highlights a few things to consider you guys mentioned it um benefits of stock tanks is like large volume of water um a sheep stock tank is often gray so therefore it can be a little bit easier to see than the black but they're also a little shorter so they don't hold as much water not as great for big bulky crops um Restaurant sinks are great because they're stainless, easy to clean, but like you said, a little more expensive. Um, and uh, the stock tanks are easier to move around. And often, you know, you can pick them up locally. Um, so I just wanted to highlight those couple things and say, say hello. <laughs> Thanks, Andy. Uh, Sarah, I think I might've cut you off when I was asking Andy to introduce themselves earlier. Did you have something? Danny and I do that with each other all the time. So that was not uncommon, or I interrupt Danny more often. Um, I had a question about coolers. Um, Monica talked about, you know, they're going to put in two 12 by 24 foot coolers, um, which I know was kind of just a uh, um, opportunistic thing with finding those panels. Um, and then Gordon, um, you guys mentioned growing out of your cooler. So I'm kind of curious about how with farm startups, y'all have um, thought through what kind of space you'll need initially. Um, and I know that sometimes it just comes down to cost and what you can afford to start, but we're kind of trying to wrap our minds around about how, how big we want to be to start and how to um, begin with something big enough that we don't grow out of in like a year or two. Sorry, uh, I think your mic is really quiet or something. That was re really hard for us to hear. Sorry, I'll try again. Can everyone hear me? Oh, that's great. Okay, sorry. Um, I had a question about walk-in coolers. Um, we are trying to think through what sizing to start with so that we don't grow out of one quickly. Um, and I know there's also just a big cost consideration with farm startups, you know, sometimes you just get what you can afford to begin. But um, for Monica and Gordon, you both mentioned, um, you know, like Gordon, that y'all grew out of one quickly. And Monica, you guys are starting with two coolers that are 12 by 24. So just kind of curious about thought process of sizing on coolers. Uh, I guess I'll go quickly first. Um, we bought uh, the cooler that we thought would fit in that space well was um, the main constraint we were facing. And that was an eight by eight by eight cooler. And once we hit about 200 CSA shares, um, weekly CSA shares, we felt like we were really maxing out that cooler. I mean, we would fill it up to capacity twice a week. Um, and so when we wanted, we knew we wanted to expand a bit more beyond that, we knew that that was time to get a bigger one and we went up to eight by 12. So not that much bigger, but it meant with a second cooler, we could have a different temperature so we could store other crops in there. Um, and I will just say, I'm not an expert on coolers, but 
when you get past the size that we're at, um, you're probably going to be not, you're less likely to use a cool bot. It's not going to necessarily be as effective as using a compressor, but at the smaller size, a cool bot has worked for us. Yeah, our, our two walk-ins, like I said, were kind of, kind of a gift. They, they fell into our lap, which is super fortunate. Um, we do want like a cold room and a cool room. We knew that we needed to start off with that. So again, we're just super fortunate to have, um, to get two of them. Um, I don't know, with our crop plan, like we do think that we'll probably outgrow them in a few years and hopefully by then we'll have the money to get a couple more. I don't know where we're gonna put them. Um, I have worked at a farm where they did have two 12 by 24 coolers and we were growing on nine acres and in our first season it did feel like we outgrew them uh, within that first year. Um, and then when I, you know, uh, catch up with that farmer, they say that they just try to sell their product as quick as they can just to move it and, and um, not try to hang on to it as much. In our crop plan, we do want to have some storage crops, overwintered stuff for our winter CSA. So I don't know how that's going to look for us. Um, but yeah, I don't know. Um, I don't know if that really answers your question, I think. Yeah. Yeah, that's helpful. Thank you. Um, one follow up. We're also um, running electric to our head farm headquarters is going to be pretty costly. So we're considering um, solar. I'm wondering if anyone has experience with using solar for um, their cooler or other areas of their wash pack. Not yet, I wish. Yeah, we don't have experience with solar, but if you're running power now and you don't have a walk in installed yet, um, if you use a compressor um you might want to run three phase uh like knowing what your cooler requirements now is going to be really helpful and potentially save you money um down the line um that was a discussion that we had uh in our and kind of figuring out our plans whether we wanted to have three phase run to our barn or just uh single phase power which is standard and cheaper to run initially um and we went with single phase. We are using cool bots um, in our in our walk-ins, uh, and that just seemed easier and less expensive to start off with. But a three-phase compressor is usually cheaper um, upfront, and I think a little bit less expensive to run as well. And I can jump on and say, probably size it bigger than you think you need <laughs> initially. I think that's kind of what everybody runs into. You're like, ah, I'm only gonna need whatever. You know, our little uh, super insulated freestanding building is only six by eight. And yeah, it's getting tight for sure. And Andy posted uh, another blog in, of uh, just cool bots and sort of, it has some links, I believe, to storage um, estimates. It really depends. I mean, my experience, it really depends too on what, what you're doing, the crops, how long you're storing them. It's a, it's a hard thing to give an answer to, especially in something like this. So uh, feel free to reach out and we could, we could have a more detailed conversation off, offline here uh, at some point and maybe get a little bit closer to that. We do have one or two farms in Pomona that are running on solar. Um, and you know, that certainly that testing and get, getting a sense of what those things draw is, is a key, key element to sizing the system. Also, this is probably something you've already thought about, but cooling is, especially in a walk-in, is going to be one of your biggest power draws. And so uh, going, jumping right, up, right off the bat into a solar array that's going to be able to power that and I would also assume a, a battery, some type of battery bank that can also keep that running. Um, it, that seems like a pretty big project as well. I, I, just off the top of my head, you probably have a lot more experience looking into it. All right, y'all, we uh, thank you for those questions and that feedback. We are bumping up towards the end. So you might remember that in this email, you received that planning form, Hans was kind enough to share the link before. And so after this workshop, if you've been working on your plan, work on a little bit tonight, work on it this week, but please 
send it to us. And Hans and Andy, if you'll put your email addresses in the chat box as well, so people can follow up with y'all. But we are, we've got two years left on this project and y'all are now officially participants in this scrub project. So maybe you didn't get a chance to ask your question tonight, or maybe you're gonna have a question or a hundred questions starting tonight, tomorrow, for the rest of your farming career, at least for the next two years. Please count on us as a resource and reach out. And if we don't know the answer, we'll find out. And, and to be honest, like Gordon's setup to me is amazing. And when someone first asked us about that type of setup, all of us uh, expert educators were a little on the fence about it. And so we used some funds to reach out to Gordon and get his expert advice too. So there's very much a farmer to farmer sharing aspect here going on. So we won't just tell you what we think, but we'll also get feedback from the field to make sure that farmers, we're talking to farmers and subject matter experts are sharing with each other. And so with that, um, we'll go backwards. So Laura, any final thoughts on today? Anything you wanna share before we go? Um, not especially, just that um, depending on what your goals are, um, a lot can be done with reused materials and um, sort of low cost resources. And it's worked for us, at least where we're at in, in terms of our farming careers. So I would encourage people to, you know, not, not think you have to have a huge, fancy and expensive setup to accomplish your goals. Thank you. And Gordon, some final thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I would say something pretty similar, like start small, start with what you have and grow from there and don't you know, if you don't have the perfect setup in the beginning, don't worry about it, you'll get there. Like when we rented land, our wash pack was on in like a, um, a shed on the side of a building. And, you know, it frustrated us. We couldn't, we couldn't pack the way we dreamed. We didn't have wheels and all these things. And then it's just taken time to get to the point where we're at now, where we have something that we feel good about. So just go slow, it takes time and you'll definitely get there. Our farm has, we did not think we would be at this point now. You will surprise yourself. Thank you. And Monica, Russell, and Scup, any last thoughts? Uh, last thoughts. Um, I would say if you're working in a group, mapping it out is just super helpful. Um, <laughs> yeah, being able to communicate in more than one medium is usually uh, <laughs> make sure that everyone's on the same page. Yeah. Why do you think that's helpful? Like, if you could pinpoint the sort of key benefit. Um, I guess maybe so wires don't get crossed. Like, you know, like everyone is seeing what you're seeing, you know, and um, everybody's able to just throw ideas on the table and like everyone's ideas just come out when you're all looking at it together, trying to map it together. I'll also say too, like, you know, de finding, dealing with our concrete contractor and then plumber and electrician and all of that, they can clearly see and know what we're expecting to as a whole group. And then once the work gets done, it's not like, oh, I thought that was going over there. Like there should be no question about it, you know? Yeah, and we all, I mean, our group, we're a group of farmers. And so we have a shared language around farm work. Um, if someone tells you to stir up hoe or hula ho a row, you know what they're talking about. But if someone says, oh, maybe we should put that roll up door on the south side rather than the east side. <laughs> or uh, someone says, oh, I really wanna have a floor drain here. Um, we might, someone might not necessarily know to ask the question, are you talking about a trench drain or just a spot drain? Um, and so having a picture to go along with it so folks know, oh, okay, this, this is not a trench drain. You're talking about a spot drain. Uh, you know, well, why don't we do this versus this uh, is, is really, it's helpful to have this kind of, um, that second layer of, of uh, communication to make sure that we're, we're really all talking about the same thing when they're, we're talking about things that we aren't particularly familiar with. And I think Andy has another <laughs> link for drains. <laughs> <laughs> and that's a perfect example of uh, like empowerment of employees too and we're, we're doing a whole workshop on that so hats off to you guys on that andy yes we do have a resource on drains so you <laughs> can check that out too if, if you're facing that very cool thanks y'all so i just want to re-emphasize please stay in touch 
So there are a lot of existing resources, but we're creating new ones because like Andy just said a couple of minutes ago, we all learned so much today, both about solutions that people are facing on farms or solutions that people are finding for problems that they're facing on farms. And so please stay in touch. Um, at least Monica and Russell can tell you, I, I kind of, I try to be a little tenacious, maybe overly tenacious about emails. So if I don't hear from y'all, I am gonna email you and I'm, I'm not trying to cost our new friendship, but I do wanna hear back from you and I really want you to be engaged with this project. So if you get a chance, send us those plans. If not, I'm looking forward to sending you a message next week.